Welcome to The Contemplative Life. Three pastors, friends, and spiritual companions help us explore spirituality through a contemplative lens. I'm Christina Roberts. I'm Chris Roberts. I'm Christina Kaiser. We're glad you joined us. Hello. It is great to be with you. We are continuing our summer series exploring the lives of mystics and contemplatives throughout history. And today we're looking at the life of Brother Lawrence, a humble Carmelite monk who lived in the 17th century. And he wrote a small book, Practicing the Presence of God, that talks about a deeper connection to God in daily life. And I read this book when I was a teenager, and I don't remember much of the book other than the fact that he made me feel like doing dishes and kitchen work was a way to get close to God. I recently read a new version by Carmen Butcher, and there are four aspects of the book that I'd like to highlight today and have us converse about. And I think the first thing is the idea of constant awareness of God's presence in every situation and every moment. And he has this quote from the book. It says, we should establish ourselves in a sense of God's presence by continually conversing with him. And so as I offer up this first insight about this constant awareness, what comes up for the two of you? I also read this book in some formative years. I think I was in my early 20s when I read this book. And I was part of a international missions organization. And I remember they really took to heart this idea of God and the ordinary things. And at the time, funny, you should mention washing the dishes. I was working in the kitchen as one of the cook preparers. They would pray before we started our shift. And I thought, this is really odd. Like we're just going to be chopping carrots. What do you pray that you don't get cut? But it wasn't that it was just this prayer of an awareness of what we're doing matters and is holy. And as I work with these different kitchen crew people, there was like very rich conversation that happened connection. We felt like what's happening with people that are doing really important and really significant things in other parts of the, the world and in our own situation, we were supporting them through the meals that we were serving and they couldn't do what they were doing without us doing what we were doing. And so I, I, I really appreciate that brother Lawrence does highlight this, that everything that we do matters. There's an awareness there and that it's sacred, whether it is chopping a carrot or feeding an orphan or doing whatever it is that we would feel is this noble totem pole of spirituality. I, I think he flattens that spiritual totem pole that I think sometimes we can get caught up in is does our life matter? Is it significant? And recognizing that, yeah, everything we do matters and has significance as we choose to be aware of that. As both of you are talking, I'm realizing, oh, there's so many ways to be aware, right? So when you first talked about awareness, I was thinking about the presence of God and then Christina, your story is reminding me of like awareness of how our lives are connected to other people's lives. And then there's the awareness of that which exists in our emotional selves or our heart connected selves. And it's funny, I was just talking to my husband earlier and I was like, yeah, awareness is like B-rolls in movies, right? B-roll, if, if you're not familiar with this sort of a term, often occurs in the passing space, but they'll show you the details of everyday life, like turning on the water, getting the soap, washing the hands, rinsing the hands, or like the pause before going into the boardroom and the hands on the doorknob. That is literally that moment of taking that time to collect oneself, not just barging through unawares of the emotional space that you're in, but movies, yeah, they just do this to help you get inside of a character when, in fact, our day-to-day -day life, this is where all the quality of life is, I have found over time. It's not in mindlessly brushing my teeth and mindlessly washing the dishes, and but in being there, being present to the experience, not, oh, I got through the day and it's gone and I don't know what happened today or how I felt or who was there with me or so yeah, this notion of awareness, it comes up in so many ways and it's it, it does take developing, it takes practice. Most definitely takes practice. I think bringing up another quote, talking about this idea of just this constant awareness, he, he talks about the dis, to discover the truth about myself. And if I have been in error, the first step to truth is the discovery of my error. 
And so just this idea of we must take a deep look at ourselves. And if there is anything that maybe we're erring on to, to just discover that and in the discovery of that, we are also finding God in the midst of that. I really love that. And I, I'll bring up the second thing. And this is something that we talk a lot of, about on the podcast is the idea of finding God in the ordinary. That's a huge theme in this book. And so as I bring up this topic again, finding God in the ordinary, what comes up for the two of you? Yes. <laughs> finding God in the ordinary has become this huge thing. And in fact, there's this author, she's still alive. Her name is Gunilla Norris. And she has written, I think, four different books on what it's like to experience God in the ordinary. But I have one of them. I think it's called On Being Home. And I had actually gotten in touch with her to say, could I use this in this other thing that I'm doing? But one of her writings is on just crossing thresholds. And this whole, it's very parable-esque, right? What is the meaning behind this thing? And there's one on sweeping, but the thresholds really catches me because it ends with, we're going to cross many thresholds today. There's going to be many of these moments. And even as her foot steps over the first threshold, what is the meaning of this? And, And can we mine it? And can we see it? And parables, they tell parables in the Bible, but A lot of faith traditions utilize storytelling as a way to get things across. And so that all of those little aspects of the day that seem so ordinary can have deeper meaning, can be speaking to us. Somehow God can commune or speak with us in the midst of it. So I'm going to keep working with my kitchen experiences. And um, I'm currently working a few hours a month at our local monastery in their kitchen as well. I I really appreciate the aspect of of cooking. And I think I've shared on the podcast, but when I think about my experience that I shared earlier in my early twenties, but as a child, my family owned a restaurant and I was the salad dessert girl when I first started at the restaurant. And interesting now, oftentimes at the monastery, I'm making salads and I've made hundreds and thousands of salads in my life. And yet in the ordinary, like this salad today that I'm making is its own unique thing that I'm doing today. And again, as is someone that's in the middle of her life, it's a little bit different than when I was 12 making a salad or even in my early twenties making salads with this group. But I, I think I do appreciate that while again, this carrot came from the earth and was grown and just really appreciating the sisters who have their garden that tended that's providing this lettuce and this carrots. And the people that are visiting the monastery today are going to eat this and nourish themselves as they are on retreat and reflecting and praying. And so again, just like taking the ordinary thing of a carrot. And again, in my earlier years, of why are we praying and the connection relationally. And interestingly enough, I used to work with a a girl who was blind and I was fascinated watching her prepare salads because I'm like, Marta, look at you chopping. And I could always tell when she chopped the carrots because they weren't completely precise because she was blind, but I don't think she ever cut herself doing that. And so she had this beautiful rhythm of how she would cut the carrots. And so something as ordinary as a carrot, having very different experiences of Marta with the carrot learning to cut carrots when I was younger at the restaurant, appreciating the garden carrot that, that that came from the sister's garden and just something as simple as the carrot really expounding in my life. So I think that's just one small example that comes up for me. I really appreciate both of your examples. And one of the things that stands out to me is the ordinary contrasted with kind of culture. I think culture kind of prepares us for greatness. That is one of the things that we aspire to is just to be great and to do great things. And this is almost countercultural, this idea of finding God in the ordinary. That is spiritual and that is significant. And the quote that was from the book, it says, we ought not to be weary of doing little things for the love of God, who regards not the greatness of the work, but the love with which it is performed. And I love that. That kind of orientates us in our motivation for our experiences. And so I really appreciate the aspect of finding God in the ordinary. The third thing that is highlighted in the book is the idea of letting go of distractions and worries, becoming fully present to God by surrendering these concerns to him to experience greater peace and trust. 
So as I bring up this idea of letting go of distractions and worries to become fully present to God, and the byproduct of that is experiencing greater peace and trust, uh, what are your thoughts? I think I come back to Christina's comments earlier about awareness and worry and anxiety are future, right? What's going to happen? I don't know the future, et cetera. Or maybe we're worried about something that happened in the past. And did we handle that situation right? And we're ruminating where an awareness of the present takes in, in my experience, takes me out of worry because all of a sudden it's like, what's here, what, what's right now, what's in front of me. And it's this podcast. It's looking at the two of you on this screen. It's this microphone in front of me, it's sharing. And so my mind can't be in worry because I'm present. And so I have found awareness to be a really helpful thing in grounding me when I find myself swirling in that of, okay, what is real right now? And that awareness really has helped me again, to lead to that peace and trust that you're describing, Chris. No, I agree with you. I think there's something about always looking forward and saying this could happen and that could happen. And then it's very different. And some of the quotes that you're reading and even the way that you're describing chopping in the kitchen relate to this, that This other way of slow down, breathe, be here, be present, allows you to connect with the preciousness of all of it. And I had gotten this word from, it was a parenting clinic, but it was psychology-based and trauma-based. And they talked all the time about, if you're going to look at your child, make sure that you always reflect their preciousness back to them. And I, I do not do this all the time, but it really stuck with me, this notion of not just my children being precious, but everybody being so precious. And that's actually God's view of each and every person. And we really don't know what's yet to come. And so to get helps me to connect with the preciousness, to be right there in that moment and not what could happen if this behavior that happened just now (laughs) continues out into the future as if us, yes, kids, developmental, whatever, but not just in children is the reality, right? We have these struggles everywhere. And where is what is at the heart of what's going on for another person? I can't find it if I'm strategizing, scheming, judging, worrying, planning, you know, all the things. Yes, it, it requires an openness to what is present. I think that's the biggest distract. Uh, so it says letting go of distractions and worries. I'm a person that I walk out to the garage to put something in the trash and to get something in the fridge. And I I find myself coming back in the house only doing one of those things. And it's it's the focus that it takes to let go is something that I find that I continually have to cultivate. Cultivating letting go of distractions or chasing things down wormholes or rabbit trails, whatever you want to say. But I really appreciate what both of you have named. And I really appreciate Brother Lawrence for his writings on this. The fourth thing that I would like to bring up is this idea of developing a prayerful attitude that goes hand in hand with the practice of gratitude. And I love how he phrases developing a prayerful attitude and that prayerful attitude of bringing things before God, leading us to a place of of thankfulness and gratitude. So as I bring that before us, what are our thoughts? I think my first thought or current realization, just based on what's been going on in life now, is that gratitude aspect often helps release some of the fear-based stuff. So I was in Psalms, I think it was 105, but I feel like you could find it in how many Psalms, but there's this kind of rhythm there of giving off this praise and then asking and then returning to praise again. And praise is often gratitude-based, but why are we sandwiching our weird worries and fears and all that stuff with all of this praise or gratitude or whatever. And I think it just does something for you. It reminds you that not everything is bad. Oh, I need this. And it's so bad. I was in a conversation with somebody recently. And honestly, you would have thought the world was falling apart, right? It it was all about how everything was so bad. And yet we were sitting on this beautiful bench under this beautiful, it was sunshiny, but we were in the shade. So we weren't getting baked and all the flowers were in full bloom. And it was a near perfect day, no humidity, but you miss it right without that moment to pause and just see it. Otherwise everything's all bad. And so I feel like, yep, that prayerful attitude 
sandwiching it with a whole lot of what is good about this moment now, it helps release some of that fear, take it down a notch for me. Going back to my experience of being in the kitchen where we prayed before our shifts and how that was unusual for me, but have come to really appreciate that. And I, in my later adult years, I worked at a catering company and that was not the vibe at all. <laughs> the complete opposite, stress, F-bombs, all the things, right? And just thinking about even rhythms and rituals of maybe praying before a meal. And I think my family, when we're with people that maybe have different faith traditions or whatever, we just tend to say a silent prayer. And we were recently invited to someone's house, 4th of July, it was uh, a barbecue and they go, they actually are people of faith. And so we're getting ready to dig into our barbecue. And usually with friends, we, we don't do that. And they said, we, we, we say a prayer before our meal. And it was like, oh, out of it wasn't in our home. It was somewhere else, 4th of July, not really in that mode, but taking that moment of pause in the ritualistic sense of, okay, this is what you do in that rhythm of praying before a meal. And again, it just set a different tone of, and I noticed too, the conversations with the adults as we went out, it's like a reminder of me of, oh yeah, these people are people of faith. We don't really relate to them. Like there are pool friends, like we know them from the pool, not from church necessarily, but it was a nice reminder of that. And I think there's something to be said about even like that ritual of prayer that we may do at different parts in our day that does lead to maybe an opening of awareness, gratitude, et cetera, that you're talking about. I really appreciate what both of you have named. And I, I think something that that is coming to my mind, I love that you brought up the the Psalms and sandwiching the fears. And I think there's a Psalm that's that that's... I'm going to paraphrase it, but it's all of my worries, all of my shame, all of my hiding, all of my fighting rest in you. And so you're just naming all the things that we face as humans, you know, resting in God. And, but then it goes into this part after naming the human frailty that exists in us, all praise to the one who loves me, all praise to the one who cares. And there's a beautiful Waterdeep song that encompasses that psalm. But just what a beautiful, beautiful way to bring before God our prayerful, the things that we're worried about that we need to embrace, but also have a hope for a future where God is present to those things. And I really appreciate just this conversation today. Thank you for having it with me. And now is the part of our podcast where we talk about what we are into. So what are we into? I am into Greek Orthodox traditions. So I recently, this past week, one of my aunts died. And so I took my older two kids to Chicago for her funeral. And she's my dad's sister and immigrated from Greece as a young adult. And so the priest just had a, a lovely service honoring her, but it was the first time that my children had attended a Greek Orthodox funeral. And on the way there, I'm explaining there's going to be incense. You're going to hear, and the service was all in Greek with a little bit of English, but it was like 90% Greek. You're going to hear these phrases, which means this, and just the beauty of kind of these old traditional rituals. We do this, the memorial, and then we go to the gravesite and Everybody has a rose and you do your final goodbye and place the rose on the casket. And there's like a certain foods that you eat and there's particular cookies that you bring to the lunch and reception afterwards. And just the symbolism of all of that. And it was just beautiful myself reminding myself of the richness of the heritage, but then also sharing that with my children as well. So that is what I am into Greek Orthodox traditions. That is so fun. I love getting to share stuff like that with family too. I think what I am into, it, it's very ordinary as it turns out, but it is changing life. So we had realized the coffee maker we had served a period of our lives when we had young children and we needed what we needed, but we didn't need that anymore. We were in a different space of what we needed. And so we got this new coffee pot. It's the Technivorm Mocha Master. The names of things just crack me up. But it makes coffee really fast. And then there's this like 15 cup, super like thermal carafe. So it stays hot for hours and there's no heating element, right? It, so you're not like burning the coffee while you keep it hot. And it's bringing so much joy because right now the stage of life we are in is we need the coffee. We need it now. We need it fast. We don't need anything fancy, just hot fast coffee. And that's exactly what we can get. And it brings me such joy. So that's what I'm into. <laughs> Very fun. Yes. 
coffee now, coffee fast is something that everyone should experience in their life. I am into something a little bit different, but it is also something that I share with my family or rather they share with me. We have been going fishing quite a bit lately and I am trying to teach my children how to get fish off the hook. And with some of them, it is going well and with others, not so well. So I've been into taking fish off of hooks for those that are still a little bit squeamish about touching fish. But the whole experience is one of just being out in nature and throwing a pole over our shoulders and walking to the place where we fish and experiencing laughter and joy in this outdoor experience with my kids. So taking fish off of hooks in the outdoors is what I've been into. Thank you so much for being with us this week. It's good to have you. We'll see you again next week. If you enjoy listening to the podcast, we invite you to stay connected by signing up for our Foundry Spiritual Center newsletter, where you can learn about even more programs and offerings. You'll find a link to subscribe in the show notes or visit us anytime at foundrysc.com. Thanks again for being with us. We hope you have a great week.